Well, good morning. I'm glad that you're joining with us this morning to continue our study of Ezekiel. We're in Ezekiel chapter 15, verse 1. I hope you have your Bible or your Bible online and a notepad and a pen. I hope that you're enjoying this study, and I hope that it is encouraging you to do your own study in the Word of God. During this time that we're living in, when we're social distancing, this is, as I've said before, this is hard for me to do this, but I'm determined that I'm going to. I think it's important that we study the Word of God, especially in these difficult times. Chapter 15, verse 1 says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, what is the vine tree more than any tree, or than a branch which is among the trees of the forest? Shall wood be taken thereof to do any work? Or will men take a pin of it to hang any vessel thereon? Behold, it is cast into the fire for fuel. The fire devoureth both the ends of it, and the midst of it is burned. Is it meat for any work? Is it good for anything? Behold, when it was whole, it was meat for no work. How much less shall it be meat yet for any work, when the fire hath devoured it, and it is burned? God, through his prophet right here, is comparing the people of Jerusalem, I believe, to a vine that does not bear fruit and is useless. Because there was no fruit of righteousness and faithfulness in them, they would experience punishment. The vine in verse 4 is cast into the fire and devoured. The nation of Israel would experience all the trials that go with captivity, including death and destruction. Cast into the fire. Sometimes we think that is total annihilation. But in the case of the nation of Israel, that was not the case. God was going to allow them... Sometimes I use the term, God draws his hand back. Because of our free will, God doesn't intervene. God doesn't get in the middle of our free will and command us to do his will. He puts his laws, his ordinances, his commandments out there, and he asks us to abide by them. It is still our choice because he gave us free will. He wanted the relationship, the covenant relationship between people at this time the nation of Israel and him to be in covenant wholly giving one to the other the nation of Israel wholly giving themselves to him and he in turn giving himself wholly to them but at this point in their time and in, in the time of the nation of Israel they're obviously not giving them wholly to the plan of God verse 6 therefore thus saith the Lord God as the vine tree among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so will I give the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will set my face against them. Hear that. I will set my face against them. They shall go out from me, from, out from one fire, and another fire shall devour them. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I set my face against them. He's talking, God's talking to Ezekiel. He says, I'm going to show you what happens when God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the I am that I am, sets his face against a person, against a people, against a nation. That was what was coming. They were already in captivity, but God wasn't done because even in captivity, they had still not turned to God. They were still not depending on God. They were still trying to do things their way. When I read this statement, I will set my face against them, I winced. We've, we've, I've read that in other places in the Old Testament. I can't remember if it was Jeremiah or Isaiah. But when you think about God setting his face against you, that would have to be the worst experience ever. Many have said that what we are experiencing today is a warning from God. Not the end times, but a warning. That there are many who are not ready for the return of Jesus. I fear believers and non-believers alike are not in that ready place. Our lamps are not full. We have slumbered and slept rather than living determined lives. Determined to fulfill the Great Commission. Determined to tell the gospel of Jesus Christ. Determined to walk in obedience to the Holy Spirit. We fail to walk in determined excellence. God loves us. Isaiah 9 tells us over and over, God's arm is forever outstretched. But if he would punish people, 
that he had done so much for, that he had gone to such great lengths to save, what makes us, us think we're any different? Verse 8, And I will make the land desolate because they have committed a trespass, saith the Lord God. The inhabitants of Jerusalem have become useless to the kingdom of God, a vine that does not bear fruit. No righteousness or faithfulness could be found in them, so God would set his face against them. From one fire, one problem, to another fire, another problem, they would go. Do we experience these kind of things in our lives today? Refusal to, to submit ourselves to God causes us to go from one fiery trial to the next fiery trial, to the next fiery trial, to the next fiery trial. We see these situations in our own lives and in the lives of other people all the time. And it, we are so lazy or so prideful that we refuse to accept that though we may talk surrender, we haven't fully surrendered to the God. To God, I've experienced this in my own life, being determined to do things my own way. And even being so rule-oriented, checking off my list, checking all those boxes, thinking I was okay, but realizing that I was checking off all the boxes. I was doing all the right things, but the heart, the, the covenant was not active in my life with, with God. Was I saved? Yes, I believe I was saved. But God had to teach me, and I had to get to the place where I was willing to be taught. It's not easy to get to a place where you're willing to be taught when you're in your 50s. That's a hard place. Have I been a good person? Yes. Have I made mistakes? Yes. But we have to get to that place of surrender to God. Otherwise, we go from one fiery trial to the next, and we, we can prevent that by submission. From Babylonian captivity to the Holocaust, even till today, the nation of Israel has gone from one fire to the next. But God has a plan, and one day God's plan will be fully executed. God has a plan for the nation of Israel. Revelation speaks of the nation of Israel. Revelation speaks of that 144,000 which were our, the Israelite, the Jewish people, that will be saved and will reign with him. God has not forgotten them. He will not forget them. And he asks us not to forget them. As I was thinking about this chapter this week, my mind was stayed on the vine. I kept thinking about the vine. According to BibleGateway.com, the word vine or vineyard is mentioned 185 times in the Bible. This 15th chapter of Ezekiel in uh, my, my Life in the Spirit study Bible gave a reference to John 15. So as I was studying, and of course because it's so important that I relate the Old and the New Testament, because it's important, I believe, for believers to understand that it's one Bible. It's in two parts, but it's one Bible. It is before Jesus Christ and after Jesus Christ. But it still relates what went on in the... God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the way we know this is through study of the Old Testament and the New Testament and realizing that they are so completely intertwined. And one can't stand without the other. In, in chapter, John 15... Verses 1 and 2, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. We've all seen how vines attach themselves to things. I have an English ivy growing near an old wagon wheel in my backyard. The ivy should quickly overtake that wheel and grow up and into the chimney on the house if it isn't pruned or taken care of by the husbandman. I can just leave that vine alone and it'll grow wild and it'll attach itself to everything. There's a lesson to be learned there. We have to be careful as believers what we attach to or what we allow to attach to us. We must be careful like the nation of Israel, that we aren't always looking back to Egypt, yearning for those worldly things. Because in the Old Testament, Egypt, to the Jewish people, when it started out and they went into Egypt, it represented safety and food and, 
and protection. But as they lived there and were enslaved for 400 years, it began to represent status quo. And the people, though there were way more Israelites than there were Egyptians, the, the people allowed themselves to be enslaved and to take commands from these ungodly people. So God, with Moses, decided to get them out of that. But all the time they were traveling in the desert, they kept looking back. If they would get thirsty, they would say, why did you bring us out here to kill us? First was the Red Sea. You just brought us out here to be killed by the Egyptian army. So God opened the Red Sea and they walked across on dry ground. Later it was water. Then they complained. Well, we could go back to Egypt and have water. Then it was food. Always looking back to Egypt. Folks, we have to be careful that we aren't trying to blend, get our little blender and blend worldly principles and worldly ideals into the Word of God. We, we tend to do that because it's easy. It's easier if we just say, well, God loves me. God's a God of love. He's not punishing. Everybody's, everybody, I'm okay. But God is true to his word. And the Bible says that the word, we're going to be judged by the word. So we have to be mindful of what we attach to what, or what we allow to attach to us. We need to dismiss, get rid of, take worldly thoughts, get rid of worldly desires, and stop doing worldly actions. We have to be careful that what we attach ourselves to are the things of God that he's happy with, that he's pleased with. And as believers, as the saved, as the redeemed, we have the Holy Spirit. I remember when I was a kid, there was a cartoon that, I don't remember the name of the cartoon, but there was always this little devil, and then there was this little angel, and the devil and the angel were on the shoulders of this cartoon character. And I remember that when this, this cartoon character would start, the devil was trying to pull him toward that wrong thought or idea or action. And the angel was trying to pull him back to right thoughts or right actions. The Bible says in, that our carnal nature is always at war with our spirit man. But that spirit is speaking to us. And we, we have to train ourselves to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. If we as branches fail to remain attached to the true vine, we will be unable to bear fruit. This makes me think of a pear tree in my husband's grandmother's yard. That pear tree had been neglected for many, many years. It was a tall tree, but it was just covered with little bitty pears. There were lots and lots of pears, but they were little bitty, and they were more like rocks than pears. They weren't good for anything. The tree was bearing fruit, but it wasn't a healthy tree, and it wasn't bearing the right kind of fruit. Had the tree been pruned back many years before I saw it, it could have produced large, delicious pears. In the end, it had been neglected so long that it could only be destroyed. And that's what God's talking about. He's in, in Ezekiel chapter 15 and in John chapter 15. He, God expects his people to bear fruit, bear fruit for his kingdom. We choose what kind of branches we are. It's our will. We choose to be fruitless or we choose to be fruitful. Now we all bear fruit in different ways. Everybody's not a preacher. Everybody's not a Sunday school teacher. Everybody doesn't go knock on doors and hand out tracts. Everybody doesn't do the same thing. God has a job a plan, a way to use each one of us as disciples for Jesus Christ. We have to figure out that way with God what that is. And then once we figure it out, we have to be obedient to that plan, that plan that God has for us. So we have to decide, are we operating in enduring faith and love for Jesus Christ? A faith that no matter how many storms come, that faith continues. Storms come in our life. Storms have come in my life. 
but my faith has not been shaken. Have I shed tears? Yes. Have I been angry? Yes. Have I blamed God? Never. But have I wondered, why me, Lord? Yes. But my faith has been enduring. And enduring means never failing, durable, imperishable. As a lot of people are making masks lately, and I've been making a few for family members that have medical illnesses, and I've been thinking, you know, you watch videos, and, and you don't want that little virus germ to get through a couple of layers of fabric. So I figured out ways to add layers, hoping to at least, if it can go through, to slow it down. I want those masks to be durable. I want them to be imperishable because I want my loved ones to be safe. I want my husband to be safe. I want myself to be safe. So we try to, to make them endure, endure washing, endure, you know, whatever, however they're treated. But God wants our faith to be enduring. He wants it to be durable. He wants it to be long lasting. So, are we, or are we fruitful branches pruned and ready? We want, to, we want to be fruitful branches pruned and ready because we have allowed the Holy Spirit to help us prune back those dead, dry parts, those worldly desires, things that divert or hinder the life flow of Christ in us. I had a Sunday school teacher one time, and a really good friend, her name is Darts, was Darts McRae, she's passed on now, but she was a precious, precious woman in my life, and she taught, she was such, a, such an amazing teacher because she was so good at using things that are everyday things in our lives to, to make you see what God was showing us. And one day she was telling me the story about Bible study because, you know, it's, and, and I was a young married woman. I was married, but I was young. And it's, I had a job and I had a family and, you know, meals and everything that goes with have, being a mother and a wife and, and having a full-time job. I was busy and I was struggling with time to, to study the word and read and pray. And she told me one time that every time she went in her at her kitchen table to sit down and study the word. She said, the coffee pot, it was almost like the coffee pot was rattling in the kitchen. Saying, well, don't do that until you come get a cup of coffee. And then it would be, when she got in to get a cup of coffee, the dishes from the breakfast would be sitting there. And there was another distraction. The devil is so good at distracting us. He will distract us with family, with people we love. He will distract us with, you know, taking care of our bills or planning meals or writing a grocery list or our favorite television program. The enemy is so good at throwing distractions out there. But we have to be careful that things that divert or hinder the life flow of Christ in us, that we learn to put those things aside to draw closer to the Lord. Verse 4 tells us that as believers are disciples of Christ, which that's what we are, we must abide in him and allow him to abide in us because the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Can I, can, can, you know, my husband go out there and plant a tomato plant and just set it on top of the ground? It won't live. It's got to have that earth around it to protect it. And when it when tomatoes show up, did those tomatoes just show up, just pop up out of the ground? No, they had to have the life support of the vine so they could grow. It's the same with us as believers. The nation of Israel had refused to abide in the vine under the protective hand of God in accordance to his laws, commandments, and ordinances. They wanted to do their own thing. They wanted to do their own thing, but they wanted to remain God's chosen nation. Even in the New Testament, the nation of Israel, the Israelites were really proud, especially the leadership were really proud that they were God's chosen, that they were somehow special, even though they were under Roman rule and authority at that time. But 
They, they wanted to be special, but they didn't want to do special. We, we've, got to want to, we've got to have a desire, that godly desire. John 15 verse 5 says, Without me, ye can do nothing. The branch is no good if it becomes unattached to the vine. If I go out there and lop a limb off the tree out there, it's not going to grow because it's been lopped off from the trunk of the tree. The life-sustaining vine, the, the root system. It's the same with us as believers. We can't stay away from God and expect to be close to God. We have to stay attached. We have to stay close. We have to snuggle in close. Verse 6, it says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. Like that branch, if I cut it off the tree and threw it on the ground, it's not going to grow another tree. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Believers must live in the world, but believers must refuse to be of the world. Men of this world will gather up weak believers. Confusing messages will be delivered, and with, without strong foundations, weak believers will believe these confusing messages. The I am that I am was never enough for Israel. They were always looking for the next new thing. And I'm afraid that's a problem in our society today. Remember by now, 14 generations had passed since David had, become, had been crowned king in Jerusalem and 14 more generations since Israel had been released from Egyptian captivity. They had failed to listen when the stories of old were told. They didn't have the King James Bible and all the many versions that we have today. They were supposed, and if you read in Leviticus or Deuteronomy, they were supposed to write them on their, their shepherd staffs. They were supposed to write them on their boxes that they wore, on their clothes. They, the, the laws, the commandments of God, the will of God was supposed to be written down. To where they, they were always seeing it. They always, it was always on the forefront of their minds. But they had failed to listen to the stories of their forefathers, to keep them active, to keep them vital in their lives. The stories of the mighty move of God's hand on their behalf had become kind of like our, our, when our parents and our grandparents tell us they walked five miles to school in the snow, uphill both ways. This is what the later generations of the nation of Israel had done. Their stories had just become stories. They failed. They had gotten to a place where their hearts were cold and they weren't believing and, and fueling that fire of, of the spirit in their lives with the stories of their forefathers. With each generation that passed, important history lessons were being ignored. They're being ignored today. The history of of our world, our civilized world, as well as the history of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We are called in the Word to work out our salvation. We are called to study to show ourselves approved. In 1 Timothy 2.15 it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman, there's work involved, that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing, the word of truth. We are called to read God's word, asking the Holy Spirit for revelation from it. Ephesians 1, 17 through 19 says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the, in the saints is. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? We are called to pray. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. We need to be in prayer in these days, people. We need to be in prayer. We need to set aside time to pray without ceasing. Does that mean that you have to go Get on your face before the God all day long and pray. No, we can pray to God while we're doing our daily tasks. We can pray while we're washing the dishes. We can pray while we're mopping the floor. We can pray while we're taking a walk. We can pray while we're sitting in our yard. 
We can pray without ceasing. There are those times when we need to go in our closet. The Bible tells us to, to go to a private place and meet with God there. But we can be in prayer without ceasing at all times. We're to draw close to God. James 4, 8 says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Doesn't say God draws nigh to us and then we, then we draw to him. He wants us to want, that's that will again. He wants us to, to, to get that will under control and choose to draw close to him. Finally, John 15, 7 says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Are you asking but not receiving? Maybe you aren't fully abiding in Jesus, but thankfully the word in Isaiah 9, 20, 21 says, for all his anger, and that anger was against the nation of Israel, is for all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is outstretched still. God's hand is outstretched to each of us. Maybe we're, you're in a place where you have moved kind of away from God because the cares of this world are heavy. You can always move back to God. All it takes is a minute to, to ask, to ask, to repent, to say, God, I'm sorry. Turn away from that thing that has drawn you away or those many things that have drawn you away and move back. Draw nigh to God so he can draw nigh to you. God doesn't wink at sin. But today, just like in the day of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, God's hand is still outstretched. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that God loves me. And when I mess up, when I fail, when I get out of his will, that he draws me back. That his Holy Spirit says, bend your knee, bow your head, turn away from that thing. Move back, to, move back to me. That's God through the power of his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is a person, but he's also a part of God. And he knows, he knows what God wants from each of us. Well, it's a shorter lesson today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you gleaned something from it. And I hope you grow from it. And I hope very soon... Though I love church on the porch at Elm Grove, I hope that very soon we're able to get back sitting on the pews and fellowshipping with one another like we used to do. It may not be the same when we first come back. Our hugs might not be as, as ready, but we can still worship together better than we can in our cars. And I hope that time is, is soon upon us. And I hope that as you hear this lesson, if it ministers to you, if any part of it ministers to you, tell me it does. That's encouragement to me. That's not pride. That's just encouraging. And also, if it ministers to you, maybe it'll minister to somebody you know. So feel free to share it. If I've said something that has blessed you, hopefully it'll bless someone else as well. Thank you for watching, and I love you, and let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord God, for your word. I thank you, Father God, that your word is true from Genesis 1 through the last chapter of Revelation, Father. I pray, God, that I've, I have shared your word, Father, as you would have me to share it, that I've not failed in any way, that I've not offended, Lord, but that I've caused thought, that my lesson is thought-provoking this morning, that we would choose, each one of us choose to, to live in the branch to as a branch, that we are attached, fully attached to you, God, as we live our lives from day to day, Father, that we would not fail, Father. For those, Father, in our church family at Elm Grove who are sick and struggling, Father, for those in our extended families, Father, who are strugg struggling with health situations, Father, that are, dif not, that are far different from COVID-19, but, Father, for our friends and our co-workers and people, Father, you know their names. You know those who are struggling with drug addiction. You know those who are struggling with cancer. You know those who are struggling with bronchitis and, and fin oh, the financial worries, Father. I pray, God, that, that those, Father, that are struggling, Father, whatever that struggle is, Father, that, Lord God, that they find a place. If they don't know you, that they find a place 
a place where they cry out to you, Father, and know, God, that you will be present as soon as they cry out, Father. I pray, God, that those that are suffering, Father, would experience your healing touch. I pray, God, for those that are lost. God, I don't know how someone that doesn't know you survives the times that we're living in today. But God, I love you, and I know, Father, that you are for everybody. And I pray, God, that those who are in the most need, Father, that they're reaching out to you right now. I thank you, God, for being present in this house today. And I love you, and I praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen.